Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel Houseplanty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it around me, it's tropical houseplants. Now today I want to talk about the plant that's in front of me, which is the Calathea orbifolia, but I also want to talk a bit more generally about Calathea and prayer plant care. So by prayer plants, I think some of them have also been renamed as Goperitia at the moment, but for the kind of usual terms that most people are used to, it'd be the Calatheas, the Cananthes, the Stromanthes, and the Marantas, because they're all under the umbrella family of the Marantaceae. Now in this video, I want to talk about a few things. Essentially, I want to give a bit of a background and maybe some knowledge that people might not know about the origins of this plant and kind of some of the morphology and also the fact that it might be edible in some parts of the world. And then I also want to talk about some of my tips in terms of how I grow Calathea or kind of prayer plants generally quite well. And I will give you a bit of a spoiler here. I kind of tend to go against the grain of what you might have heard of for most Calathea. And it's been successful for me. So I thought I would share in terms of anybody else wanting to try this. As always, I will caveat this and say it's worked for me in my care and my environment. But if you do want to try any of these things, by all means, please do. If you've got any comments, by the way, for anything that I'm going to say in this video, do drop them in the comments down below. Let's have a conversation. So in terms of care, what I want to talk about is a few things. It's the maturity of the plant, the patterning of the plant, humidity levels, and watering. And essentially, let's start with why they're called prayer plants. Prayer plants is because if you look at how their leaves are during the day, they will be down like this, and at night they will move up and close almost a bit like hands in prayer. Another thing to be aware of of these plants is this is a type of plant that a lot of people will buy to have in low to medium light situation, mainly because in nature these types of plants will grow in the understory. So they will grow underneath trees, in the jungle, in forests, so on and so forth. But Another thing that might be of interest to some people is that in a lot of regions of the world where this plant will grow naturally, a lot of Maranta, a lot of the Marantaceae family, some of the Calathea as well, they are related to the arrowroot. And for any bakers out there, arrowroot is a powder that's a bit of a thickening agent, a bit like corn flour. And obviously I'm not saying to dig up the bulbs because that's what is edible. It is the bulb of these plants. They've got little bulblets that grow in the soil with the roots and it looks a bit like little mini potatoes. And that is essentially what is ground up to create the arrowroot. I think it's a very specific plant that arrowroot comes from. It's not from just generally any form of calathea or any form of prayer plant. So I will say again, do not dig up the bulbs and try to cook them. <laughs> there are things that a lot of these uh, people in these indigenous areas will do in terms of preparing these roots for food. But I thought a bit of an interesting thing that most people might not know. The other thing to bear in mind, and I will pick up this specific plant as well, just so you might be able to see, and I'll see if I can move a couple of the leaves. Can you see that cigar-like structure there? And there's one right there as well. These are the new leaves and that is how they emerge. They emerge in a little bit of a cigar formation, so it's kind of a tube. And the belief within scientists is that the reason why it grows quite like that is because essentially it minimizes the look of how big the plant can look at to the potential predator animals out there. So let's talk about the maturity of the plant first, which is the biggest thing that I've discovered with a lot of my Calathea. Now, I'll be completely honest and say that I don't have as many Calathea or as many prayer plants as a lot of you might have done when I was first starting off with my collection. As with most people, I tended to gravitate towards really, really ornate, beautiful looking prayer plants. Now, <laughs> And this is something that people might already be starting to experience if you just started to get into your prayer plants as well. The more ornate the leaves are, the more colourful the leaves. So for instance, the Rosia picta, the pinstripe calathea, all of these ones that have got kind of pink flushes or really, really colourful, I found are quite tricky 
generally to care for. They will crisp up on the leaves really quickly and they are particularly challenging to look after. They also have slightly thinner leaves and that's something that I think a few other YouTubers have mentioned as well. The calatheas or the prayer plants generally that have very very thin leaves, the papery thin leaves, they can be more unforgiving than some of the other calatheas. So for instance the orbifolia has got slightly thicker more succulent leaves. They're not succulent by any stretch of the imagination but they are thicker than the papery thin leaves of the pinstripe for instance. And I keep mentioning the pinstripe because I tried a lot with that when I still managed to kill it. And that's another thing as well. This is sold quite readily in stores for not a lot of money. So a lot of people will pick it up thinking that it's a relatively easy plant to take care of. And yes and no. If you know what you're doing and you've done this a few times, possibly and this might be a bit of an unpopular opinion. Uh, for me, this is a bit of an advanced plant. It's like generally the, the not all prayer plants, the, the Marantas generally are a bit more forgiving, but Calatheas generally, a lot of the Calatheas, for me, are a bit more of an advanced plant. Get used to growing other plants first and then maybe get into this. Another thing as well to maybe bear in mind is if you can keep a fern happy, which again, a lot of people do recognize that ferns can be quite challenging indoors, you probably can keep a calathea happy. Now, coming back to what I was talking about in terms of maturity, the thing that I have found worked really well for me, and that is pretty much how I started all of the calathea that are still in my collection, is I start them off really young. I start them off as little plantlets, probably no, long, no bigger than this for most of them, with only a couple of smaller leaves, and then slowly grow them up to a more mature form. What this has taught me, and I can say this a bit more absolutely in my situation at least, because I've tried it on different type of calatheas, the calatheas that have started off from younger plants, you get a couple of benefits. One being that you can tell if it's in distress a lot quicker, and the other one is you can address it a lot quicker, and whatever you do then will probably have quicker effect. I find the more mature calatheas, the ones that people might just be picking up um, at whim at most plant stores or garden centers, they tend to be a bit less forgiving, they take a while to show a problem, and if you try to fix something it will take a while to start appearing. So that's one thing. But, and this is the, the negative side of this, is if you're getting something from a smaller plant, it can take a while to get to a bigger size. So let me just lift this up again. So to get my Orbifolia to this level, this has taken nearly a year, a year and a half. So it does take a while to get to this stage. But the other thing that I have found is not only that it tells you if it's in distress a lot quicker, they tend to be more hardened to your specific conditions. And this is key because a lot of the bigger, more mature specimens have been acclimated to extremely specific conditions within the grower's environment. So greenhouses and all these things where a lot of things are probably maintained at certain constants, which are almost impossible to replicate in a household. So I'll come back to this again and say that by starting it off small, yes, you might see it crisp up a bit more when it's younger and it will look a bit janky for the beginning, but if you can push through that for a few months and get the calatheas used to your environment, you will thank me for it later because they'll be a lot hardened, they'll be a lot more hardened essentially to your environment. This doesn't get particularly high humidity, which is something that a lot of people say about most calatheas that you need to have really high humidity. This one probably gets a bit, maybe slightly more humidity than just average household. And a lot of people that have had orbifolias before, they will know that they will crisp up quite quickly as well. I've never really had any crisping on the leaves when it matures. And again, I will try to show you some of the older leaves when it was the baby leaves. There was some crisping there. There was also some cold damage and I will quickly touch on cold damage. When I first moved into this property in the conservatory, the heating wasn't working particularly well for a few nights and I hadn't realized and it dropped really, really low. This was one of the plants as well that experienced cold damage. So the midrib of the leaf went black and there's a lot of crisping on the leaves, but it still bounced back and that should tell you something because a lot of the mature calatheas that you'd be getting from the stores probably wouldn't have bounced back from that. If you've had any experience with calathea, <laughs> they tend to be a bit fussy and unforgiving. 
But I thought this might be an interesting thing for people to know, because I don't think I've seen a lot of people mention something like this. And this has been my experience with all the calathea that I have now in my care. Start them off young, be patient with them, and you'll get that big showy plant that you wanted without it being too troublesome. I don't mind caring for my calatheas now because they don't cause me any level of stress. The other thing that I've noticed, and yes, calatheas generally are very prone to pests, are very prone to very specific pests, which is spider mites. And I still check most of my calatheas. Every time I will water them, I'll just quickly look at the leaves and quickly turn them around just to see if there's any spider mites issues. And then I'll quickly treat it with my neem oil solution. And that works really fine. But the interesting thing that I've found with these ones that I've hardened off in my environment is, and I'm trying to think now, I don't think, and touch wood doesn't mean I'm not going to get it, I don't think in over the year and a half, to nearly two years that I've been trialing this different method, because obviously I've been doing this for a year and a half with this one, but I've done it with for a bit longer with some of my other calatheas, I've not had spider mites. Take from that what you will. The other thing that I wanted to touch on is watering. And watering is one of those things that they say about calathea that can be really tricky because in an ideal world, they'd want distilled water, even filtered water isn't clear enough of all the little tiny chemical elements. And some people use reverse osmosis water to keep their calatheas from crisping up. And essentially why this happens is at the very end of the leaf tip, which is usually what crisps up and goes a bit brown, is the thinnest part of the leaf. So those salt deposits go and deposit within that very thin part of the leaf. And that's what causes the crisping. Shocker for this one, this and all my other calatheas who also somehow have managed for over a year or two now to not have any brown tips are all on tap water. And I live in a very, very hard water area in the UK, so that should tell you something. But I don't think that's just because I've been acclimating these in my environment. The other thing that I've done for a while now is add a small amount of a specific fertilizer called liquid gold leaf. It's very available in the UK. I think you can order it worldwide. Uh, I think they do ship worldwide now. And the one of the claims that their website says, and I don't know if it's still on there as a while ago when I saw this, is that if you add some liquid gold leaf to tap water, it, I think what it does is maybe binds, somehow kind of expunges some of those chloramine and some of those chemical elements that can cause some of this damage. And I was a bit dubious with this statement, but actually adding a tiny bit of liquid gold leaf to the regular tap water before I water my calatheas has meant, I think, based on this experience, that it doesn't cause any browning on the tips. So it might be one for you to trial. I know a lot of my followers who are based in the UK already do use liquid gold leaf. Maybe one to trial for a bit. It, you won't see results inter instantaneously, especially if you've got more mature plants, but give it a trial, you never know. And I'm not saying to fully fertilize a plant every time, I'm just saying a small amount of the liquid uh, gold leaf fertilizer within the water, you might be surprised. And the other big thing about this that a lot of people say generally with calathea or prayer plants generally is because they like to have evenly moist soil, that you should have them in a slightly denser soil. It still needs to have some aeration. All of my calatheas at the moment are in a very, very light, airy, aroid mix. So the same thing that I would use for my philodendron, the same thing that I would use for my anthurium, that light and airy and my monsteras is what is being used now for my calatheas. I will say this, however, when you get something like a calathea from a plant store, it might just be straight cocoa fiber. It's, it tends to be more denser soil. And what I found sometimes with those soils is it used to take weeks for them to dry out enough for me to water it again. And I never really saw much benefit to the plant. If anything, the, the growth pattern was a bit slowed down and everything like that. When I put it into my aroid mix, yes, I do need to water more frequently. I think most of my calatheas get watered once every five or seven days now. But the growth level from that has been insane. They seem to really, really love it. So obviously I'm not telling you to put them into a cactus soil mix, which really doesn't maintain any moisture at all. But if you want to know what I use for my airy aroid mix, there is a video on my channel. Do check it out. 
But yeah, that's another thing that it's a bit of a myth busted in my experience. Chunkier area soil mixes work really, really well. And just to wrap up, I want to touch on lighting really quickly. And I've mentioned this on a few other videos, just because a plant will tolerate low to medium light, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to thrive. I think a very bleak way of seeing this, and I've seen a lot of other people mention this as well, is with some plants when they're in low light, they are just dying off a bit slower than you would expect them to. So <laughs> do that what you do with that what you will. But with this plant, with most of my calatheas, I actually give them medium to bright indirect light and they do a lot better. A lot of my calathea that I kept in more medium or low light situations, it was taking too long for the soil to dry out, even the light airy soil mix. The, the leaves were taking too long to grow. All of these plants now that are in a slightly brighter location, this one specifically, I know the orbifolia can take a bit more light than most calathea. This one is in an east facing window at the moment and it's doing really, really well. But yeah, I think that's kind of me busting enough myths about this plant and as I said I just wanted to do this video because my experience have been so polarizingly opposite to what the norm is and what most people are saying and I tried what most people were saying and it didn't really work for me but this has and hopefully this might help some of you out there but yeah I think I've probably prattled on for very very long this is probably a lot longer of a video than I would have wanted it to but I know this is a plant that for a lot of people can be quite a stressful plant to keep happy so i thought it's good enough to have a slightly longer video but yeah hopefully you've enjoyed hopefully i shall see you here soon and i truly truly hope you have a great rest of your day thanks bye